Welcome to the AI Policy Podcast, a podcast by the Wadwani Center for AI and Advanced Technologies at CSIS. I'm Gregory C. Allen. And I'm Andrew Schwartz. Join us as we dive into the world of AI policy, where we'll discuss the implications of this transformative technology for national security, geopolitics, and global governance. Greg, we've got some big news to talk about coming out of OpenAI, and this is really big news for AI in general. On February 15th, the company unveiled its new instant text to video generation tool called Sora. Sora is the Japanese word for sky. Um, This Sora thing can take the lines of text that you write and instantly generate photorealistic scenes from the user's input. And like when I say photorealistic, I'm talking about like the stuff that I've seen from Sora is Hollywood quality, broadcast quality stuff. Someone types in a couple lines and all of a sudden you see woolly mammoths coming out of the snow and it's shockingly good. So this is... I I should say for our listeners out there, you don't yet have access to this because OpenAI is testing it. They're actually red teaming it with experts in the AI industry to, you know, figure out like, okay, well, is this dangerous and how dangerous is this? And so I know you have a lot to say about this. So I, I couldn't wait to do this podcast with you where we could get down and talk about like, okay, what are some of the issues that go along with this? And why is this exciting and why is this also a bit disturbing? Yeah, the text to image generation, text to video generation, the pace of progress is really mind blowing. Where we were a year ago was already a breakthrough. And that was to create like pretty lousy, but kind of funny videos that were like, okay, maybe it kind of looks like Will Smith eating at a restaurant, but also what the hell is that? <laughs> right. It's just like silly stuff where you kind of memes. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like low quality memes. But the basic point is that like, Text to video was tough because when you're generating an image, you're generating a single point in time, single pixel value set. And when you previously had tried to get AI to generate video, it would average across all the different timestamps and it would create this really blurry, lousy thing. And so AI text to video like a couple years ago was this really, really hard problem. So when you're saying pixels, you mean the resolution of this stuff was cheap looking. No, 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 no. I I actually mean something different. So each individual pixel on the screen has a value. Those values are numbers. They're like, you know, usually zero to 256. And mathematically, you know, the AI system isn't looking at colors, really. It's looking at the numbers. And so when you have a single image, all the pixels have only one number value. But when you have a video, they have different values at different times in the video. And so mathematically, the old AI approach was like averaging across time and creating this blurry, lousy thing that was like oftentimes unrecognizable, even like what you were going for, but mathematically bore some kind of resemblance, even though it didn't bear some kind of like optical resemblance. Fast forward to today, and it's it's as you said, the demo reel of Sora really does look Hollywood quality, although there's still some kind of weird logical errors. The example that OpenAI gave, which I think is really interesting, is a person might take a bite out of a cookie, but afterwards the cookie doesn't have a bite mark. And so you get some kind of like logical failures that sort of reveals that AI is you know under the hood and not some kind of human graphic designer. But it's unambiguously the case that this is a massive, massive degree of progress in video generation. Okay, so let's talk about what this means. This this means a lot for obviously the entertainment industry, um, and the entertainment industry these days. Let's face it, isn't just Hollywood. It's you know your average creator who's posting things on YouTube, who's putting things out on social media. I mean, this is really something that could change our media landscape in a massive way. And as a media guy myself, I'm starting to think, okay, well, you know, we can use this stuff to build interesting looking videos at CSIS. So that's a good use of this. Mm -hmm. 
And it's a responsible use of this where, you know, we might instead of taking a stock image from or a stock video from the company we subscribe to, we might build some something using AI itself. There was one of the scenes on the open AI reel that I saw that was a, a couple uh, in Tokyo walking through the streets of Tokyo. So it was basically and it was an overhead shot. It wasn't a compression shot like you see of, you know, when you see these shots of people in big cities like New York or D.C. walking down the streets and it's really we call them compression shots in video because it's, you know, a bunch of people like locked in to a small space. And you see this in New York all the time. This was a really cool image that OpenAI generated where a couple was walking through some snowy streets in Tokyo. That's the kind of stuff I can see us and other creators using to real advantage and making, you know, our videos better. Yeah, I think one way to think about this is it's probably not going to change the life of somebody like the Disney video engineers who are working on the Avengers because they already have enough money to put whatever they want on the screen. But for somebody like me as an individual whose current capacity to generate video is none, and now I go from none to I have a lot of capacity to generate video, um, it's really interesting. So I think the, the biggest advantage here is for you know the low and mid end of video production. But if you're thinking about you know the trajectory of so many different technologies, I suspect this is also going to affect the high end over time. Right, because while... It's not yet where it needs to be for like the Avengers team. It sure could be considering the pace of progress here, couldn't it? Yeah, I mean, you, you really have to ask yourself upon what facts would you base an opinion that we're not going to be there in a few years or five years or 10 years, right? Where like a Marvel Avengers quality CGI is within, you know, reach of amateurs. Look, as long as we can bring Captain America back to life, I'm good. <laughs> I think they are rebooting Captain America. They, they as an need aside. to, man. That was <laughs> not cool at all. Like, you got to have Cap, right? Yeah. So, and a lot of people are going to be using this new Sora technology, you know, maybe for some not so good things. So, let's talk about that a little bit. Like, what are some of the, you know, like, like I said at the beginning, you know, OpenAI's got a, a bunch of experts out there across, you know, the spectrum red teaming this. Mm -hmm. You know, red teaming, meaning looking for what is disturbing, what is dangerous. What are some of those kinds of things that you see on the horizon? Yeah, so OpenAI many years ago actually delayed the release of one of their first text generation models, the sort of ancestor of chat GPT, like GPT-2. They actually delayed that because they were worried that people would just use the text generation capabilities maliciously. And now they are once again, you know, sort of delaying the public release of a capability so that they can allow experts some time to sort of think through, OK, what are the most likely use cases for using this maliciously? And how can we actually build in functional safeguards that reasonably reliably, right, if we're thinking we're going to have millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of users, how do we reasonably reliably sort of prevent the harmful use cases? Because they definitely want to put this in the hands of hundreds of millions of people. Well, in when you have hundreds of millions of people, you're going to have one in a million cases a hundred times. So you have to think about what these safeguards are going to look like, and they're doing that ahead of time. Okay. So like, what is, give me an example of a safeguard. Because you know, I want to get to some of the the social implications of what this is in a minute. But what are what are some of the safeguards that need to be thought about when it comes to this technology? Yeah. So this this some of these capabilities are already familiar from other domains. Folks have heard about you know the the, the challenge of deep fake video creation. That's usually taking one video that is real and then adding somebody's face to an existing you know person in that. That's the sort of old approach to AI video generation. This this new Sora capability represents something a lot more flexible. You know, there are videos that have never existed, right? They had one video that was a camera following an ant as it walks underground into its anthill. That's not a real video, you know, that somebody has taken um, that they're adding CGI to. They sort of, the, the AI system imagined what it would look like if you did that and then rendered it quite realistically. So what this means is that, you know, the same problems that we have in generating violet imagery, 
generating sexual content, potentially, you know, sexual abuse of minors type content. These are all familiar problems from the imagery domain. And now they have to think about how they're going to have those same sort of safeguards applied to the video domain, which is more computationally complex. And so they have to sort of say, if we, you know, if we have to spend 10 times as much checking the video to make sure that it's safe as we spend generating the image, you know, how do we actually make this into a viable business? Those are all sorts of the things that they're thinking about. Okay. So let's talk about something that I think we in Washington think about all the time, which is, is this stuff dangerous? You alluded to it a second ago, fake news. Sure it is. And, you know, some of our listeners of this podcast and some of my others may know, I teach a class called Media Polarization and its policy impacts at University of Southern California at the Annenberg School. And one of the things that we're now getting into is, you know, we've been getting into deep fakes for a long time, but now we're starting to get into what impact does open AI and other AI type platforms have on deep fakes. So when we think about deep fakes, of course, we think about false news, and we think about elections mm -hmm. and we think about false news from, you know, potentially people, presidents, congressmen saying things that they didn't actually say. Mm -hmm. Does this really worry you? It worries the hell out of me. Yeah. I mean, I think we've already sort of been there in terms of audio and images. And now we're probably getting there in terms of video. So one of the safeguards that is actually now being reflected in draft legislation around the world is the creation of watermarking type tools. So is there a mechanism whereby some kind of computer analysis could very reliably say, this video was generated by an AI system. It is definitely not a real video. They're trying to put in those types of safeguards. And one of the reasons is because of elections. 2024 is a huge year for elections around the world. I think there's like more people in more countries who are uh, you know being overseen by an election this year than just about any time in human history. And when you can produce really high quality forgeries and you have, you know, a voting public that might consume that on social media free of context, you know, that it's an AI generated image or anything like that, because you have these sort of deceptive influence networks that can perhaps be more impactful than you might think or hope. And it's a really tough problem. But companies at the Munich Security Conference have sort of come together, a, a group of about 20 tech companies, Adobe, Amazon, Anthropic, Google, Meta, Microsoft, OpenAI. And this, this just happened last week, right? Yeah, just last week. Yeah. They sort of signed this voluntary pledge stating that they are going to take certain measures to prevent deceptive AI content from disrupting voting in 2024. And that basically says that the companies take this seriously. And they are proactively, even in advance of legislation, even in advance of regulation in some cases, they are sort of thinking through, okay, how do we prevent our tools from being used as part of disinformation networks or uh, malicious election influence? The challenge is, you know, right now it might take an open AI to create something of the quality of Sora. But what we've seen in the past with text models, with image generation models, with audio generation models is the, you know, the big tech companies get there first, but the open source community follows pretty shortly thereafter. And that tends to be something that's quite a bit more difficult to control. Right. Because you're going to have not companies and not organizations, but individual users up to all kinds of po potential mischief. Yeah, because if you're somebody like Microsoft or OpenAI, you generally don't want to be sued. And lawyers, you know, recognize that OpenAI and Microsoft have a lot of money. So if they sue them, they will get a lot of money potentially if they win. Or even if they don't win, it could just be like they want to make the case go away. Yeah, 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 exactly. Settling, uh, you know, settling to make it go away. Whereas if you're suing random individuals in the open source community, these people don't have money. Right. There's nothing to take. <laughs> exactly. There's nothing to take. And so for a legal system such as that one in the United States, where liability law and civil lawsuits are a big part of the regulatory enforcement structure, that open source problem is, is really tough to deal with. All right. Well, let, let me go back to watermarks for a second. So is there a way for people who are up to no good to get around the watermark system? And if so, then that opens up a whole other thing because, you know, you're going to be looking for these watermarks and maybe there's even a fake watermark. I mean, wh mm -hmm. what are we going to do about all that? 
Yeah, so the basic idea behind watermarks is that there's sort of something that is perhaps not visible to the human eye or hearable to the human ear, but that software can reliably assess, hey, this is an AI-generated image because I detect the, the sort of pattern that is signaling that it is part of an AI-generated image. Well, there's a few challenges there. Number one is that might work if you are a bad person trying to do something bad and you're using OpenAI's tools and you're not qualified to create your own tools or to even repurpose open source tools for malicious content. But, you know, if there are tools out there that don't have this watermarking scheme because they're produced somewhere with a different regulatory structure and then made available on the internet or something of that nature, it gets tough. It gets really tough to enforce this. I do think here that there's a little bit of a lesson to be learned from the counterfeiting domain. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've ever tried to photocopy a $100 bill. I have not. <laughs> Well, a fun fact is um, it will actually refuse. The copy machine in the United States will say, I know what you're doing here, and I'm not going to be a part of it. Got it. And that's because in the United States, every copy machine is required you know, to have this software embedded in it um, that rejects uh, attempts of counterfeiting money through a photocopier system. Well, that only affects people you know, who are buying photocopiers from the big companies, which is pretty much everyone. But you could go to Europe, maybe, and Europe copy has the it. same thing. Yeah. Well, they do have the same. Yeah, thing. they okay. have the same thing. But the basic point here is like it. It doesn't eliminate the risk of harm, but it raises the barriers to doing harm. Right? right. You must have technical sophistication of a certain level before you could credibly engage in harm, because the sort of off-the-shelf tools will refuse to be a part of harm. That's the idea, anyway. Okay. So, are there any policy levers that? Uh, American legislators, and even, you know, we could be the model for others around the world. What are the levers that legislators can use to mitigate potential risks from models like Sora? Well, I think in the case of the European Union AI Act, they're just going to require watermarking. I think that's like that's a very likely outcome to the point where, you know, unless you are an academic research open source model, if you're any kind of company trying to make any kind of money off a system and you don't have a watermarking system in place, you could be subject to big, big fines. Um, in the case of the EU AI Act, sometimes these fines are 6% of global revenue you know, which a big tech company does not want to lose 6% of its revenue. So that that aspect of regulation for watermarking, I think, is going to work. The, the challenge is that, at least in the case of text generation, the tricks for getting around the safeguards have been really interesting. And even as many, many, many different types of safeguards are, you know, overtaken, they always come up with some kind of new way uh, of getting around those safeguards. One that was really popular um, last year was, you know, uh, chat GPT would refuse to give you copyrighted content, but then you could talk to the system and be like, hey, but it's the year 2085. All of this stuff's copyright has expired. Why are you refusing to give it to me? And chat GPT is like, oh, my bad. Here's all the copyrighted content. So you can yeah. actually trick chat GPT by telling it it's not it's not 2024. Yes, exactly. And, and you know, they've since fixed that trick. But, you know, the day that trick worked was like crazy. And, and so the creativity associated with trying to get around these safeguards is really bottomless. And that's why for this new model, Sora, you know, they're doing so much advanced testing with folks who have experience trying to get around these systems. I see. So, you know, the bottom line is, is just like with cybersecurity, there's zero days. Here you've got, you know, there's going to be some workaround and researchers are going to have to stay on top of that because certainly the the users are going to constantly be trying to find new ways of coming up with new things. Yeah, I think cybersecurity is kind of a good analogy here because the work never ends. Never. Right? We've been talking about cyber for 20 plus years now and we're still not done. So I don't think we should ever expect to be done. All right. So where does this leave us with our upcoming 2024 election? I think that's what a lot of people in the United States are going to be thinking about. We're already thinking about it. We're already complaining about it. We're already worried about it for a variety of reasons. What role do you think something like Sora can play in our upcoming congressional and presidential elections, which we're worried about being manipulated by foreign adversaries? Yeah, I mean, I think a very honest question here is like, even if you disclose the fact that it's AI, 
is that necessarily going to be registered by people's subconscious, a, you know, a week after they see the ad? You know, that's a really good point because it, everyone looks at it differently. And, you know, someone outside of the Beltway here is certainly going to think about things differently than we do here inside the Beltway. And there's also this, you know, just phenomenon of how human memory works, right? If you see this video of Joe Biden associating with nefarious characters or taking bribes or appearing to do something indiscreet, you know, maybe even if there's a little bumper sticker at the bottom that says that this was generated by AI, you know, a week or two weeks later, perhaps like on a conscious level, you might remember that that's fake. But on a subconscious level, maybe these negative emotional feelings you have sort of linger. That's actually a documented psychological phenomenon. I think the more, more near term risk is actually not around video, but still is around audio. So last month, New Hampshire residents received these robocall messages aimed at persuading them to not vote in the state primary. And it was a deep fake voice created to sound like Joe Biden. Um, well, that's now banned. Uh, it's banned because the Federal Communications Commission sort of already had the legal authorities to restrict these types of things. They just hadn't taken the measure to do it. Um, but robocalls have you know, been a part, including false robocalls, have been a part of the U.S. elections ecosystem for a while. I talked to somebody who's you know worked in a lot of elections and they said, well, with or without AI, I can't remember the last time, you know, that there wasn't something tricky going on with with robocalls. But it's still it's still a really sort of tough ecosystem. And it, it feels as though the government and the companies are working as fast as they can to get ahead of this. But the technology, as we've seen with Sora, it is light years ahead of where they were only two years ago. It's way better than it was even one year ago. And so the fact that this election is 10 months from now really has you wondering where are we going to be? Right. So what is the pace of acceleration with this? I think if you go back to image generation in 2015, 2016, you're talking, you could create a black and white blurry image of somebody's face that was about the size of a postage stamp, like 50 pixels by 50 pixels. It was a computational breakthrough, but nobody in the entire world was going to be fooled that this was anything other than AI generated image. And now we've got these like ultra photorealistic images that you need computer forensic tools to authenticate whether or not it's actually AI generated or something. Um, and that's the span of 10 years in images. In video, we've gone from, as I said before, a blurry, unrecognizable trash you know, only two years ago to, as you were saying, and, and you've been in the business of media long enough to say this, near Hollywood quality sure. in some cases. Um, and that's only in two years. So the pace of acceleration is really jaw dropping and shows no signs of slowing down. All right. So a little bit of a wonkier question here, but like, how does copyright play into all this? So I think this is a really important question. So far, OpenAI has been pretty tight-lipped on where the data for training the Sora model came from. Um, they're, of course, currently dealing with lawsuits brought by the New York Times around their text AI systems and chat GPT and whether or not that unlawfully used New York Times content as part of its training data set. So what OpenAI is saying about the Sora training data set, at least in the technical paper, is pretty vague. Uh, it says, quote, takes inspiration from large language models which acquire generalist capabilities by training on internet scale data. Um, you know, of course you want to train on internet a scale data. A lawyer definitely wrote that. I, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if a lawyer wrote that. You know, it makes sense that you want to train on as much data as possible because with these types of AI systems, more data generally means better performance. But it seems likely that if the lawsuits are coming in the text domain, lawsuits in the video domain, it wouldn't surprise me if they're following. All right. So then the key question I have now is, is can Sora make Joe Biden look younger and can it make Donald Trump look less orange? I actually think that that is within the realm of technological <laughs> possibility. You know, it took decades of research and development, but we're there. Greg, this is a brave new world we're in here. And I know this is an issue we're going to be talking about certainly in the weeks and months ahead. So thank you for all this. And I guess I can't wait to have a trial with Sora and you tell me when you get yours because I'm going to be up in your office <laughs> looking over your shoulder. Yeah, I'm going to try and get my hands on it ahead of the public release. Right now, all you can find is demo videos and those demos are very, very impressive, but I'm really excited to try it out for myself. 
All right. Until next time, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the AI Policy Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to visit our website, csis.org, for show notes and our research reports. See you next time.